Hey everyone. Um, this is Miyoung Cha, and I'm so happy to be able to give a talk at TTO. I wish I could be with everyone in person and hope that could happen in the next year. And thank you for organizers for putting together this program and for inviting me with this wonderful opportunity. So I want to talk about emotion and information, misinformation in times of public health crisis. So during the couple of the last couple of months, one thing that you heard every single day would definitely be COVID-19. Many of the information you hear would have been true, but some were false. You might remember this rumor that says, Drinking strong alcohol will kill virus inside your body. Cleaning with very strong alcohol may kill the virus on the surface of some objects, but it's not going to kill the virus that's already inside. Hot air dryers can kill the virus. This rumor is in fact really dangerous because it could lead to, you know, get some people burned. And in my home, my father used to come home from outside and he would start drying the face mask with hot, dry air. Now he doesn't do that anymore. Holding your breath for 10 seconds, then you can know whether you're infected with the virus or not. Now this rumor is really funny, but at some point in United Kingdom, I saw in the news that the guards at one of the building asked people to hold their breath for 10 seconds before they allow the people to come into the building. There are tons of other false claims that we have seen, including eating garlic, ginger, and onion could help prevent the infection, salt water gargling or smoking. Some rumors also say if you're a vegan, you're not going to be infected with virus shaving heads. So there are tons of rumors that we have seen. And many of them are worldwide, such that they are they could be seen in many different parts of the world. But some rumors only spread in one country or two. One of my favorite is from China, and it's fireworks will kill the coronavirus in the air. Now we hear about the word infodemic, which is a combination of information and epidemic. And it describes the phenomena where there's so much of accurate information as well as wrong information to the point that individuals are not able to discern which is what. And this is a very dangerous situation in times of pandemic because individuals may start making decisions based on wrong information. One such incident happened early on in, in Korea. So this news says coronavirus outbreak among South Korean churchgoers traced to saltwater spray. So in one of the churches, in a large church, the people were spraying salt water into each other's mouth and they were thinking it's going to be safe to gather together in a small place. And this led to tens of peoples of infected cluster. And we have seen in Iran, Vietnam, and in, in many, a few of the other countries, many people died or got severely injured because of methanol infection. And we have also seen really funny news, such as in Hong Kong, um, robbers stole 600 rolls of toilet papers because they saw uh, there were people doing panic buying and the toilet papers were basically running out from many stores. In Korea, we had ramyeon and rice that we stocked up in our home and still we are slowly consuming whatever we have stocked up in the past. So many of these rumors could be funny, but some of them leads to large clusters of infection, which is really costly and also sometimes help make people lose their life. 
So in times of infodemic, when there's so much of true and false information, and when we are not able to discern them at individual level, how can we cope with COVID-19 rumors? We can try to bring some insights from existing research. One of them is from my own work, where we see that while individuals cannot identify which one is true or false, if we look at information, how it's spreading from the top, their networks will look very different. So the rumor networks and the facts network will go through, involve different kinds of people and different kinds of sentiments such that we will be able to detect which one is rumor-like. Once we identify which information is spreading as if they are rumor-like, then credible sources can step in and they can do the fact checking. And this needs to happen pretty early on because many research has shown that if the rumor starts propagating, they're very sticky, they're very infectious, and they're just gonna spread very widely, sometimes much faster than the true information. So the, there's something the concept of the golden time and the credible, so credible sources should be able to step in early on. In South Korea, this happened very nicely because some of the rumors were debunked by the Korean CDC in a couple of hours, for example, like the hair dryer one. Another important aspect is repeated flagging on social media is really helpful. There's a study that shows that when people see a tag that shows this information may be wrong, then people no longer start sharing that information. This visualization is from a paper by Facebook group, and it is showing how a single Facebook post is being shared on the network. So the circles are the nodes or the people who are sharing that information, typically blue nodes, and the red nodes mean in the one of the comments of that shares, somebody have posted this information is, has been fact-checked to be wrong. And you see that whenever there is a fact-check, there is much likely that people will stop sharing that information further. So combining all of these information, the previous research can guide us to the fact that preemptive strategy is really important because when false information starts spreading, it's really hard to contain. And also credible sources should step in much early on during the initial phase. And nonetheless, even when the fact checks are available, people are going to still start sharing because they're not aware of the fact checks, so that we need to repeatedly flag whatever information that is wrong. So based on these observations, we wanted to start a campaign. We wanted to contribute somehow uh, with our skills, and we teamed up with many scientists around the world and launched a campaign called Facts Before Rumors. This started from the observation that many of the rumors that we, that we saw in Korea already had existed in China and had been already fact-checked by the time they were spreading in Korea. And also many of the rumors that we see abroad had already been in Korea and had been fact-checked but nonetheless, they're translated into different languages and they start spreading, causing much harm throughout the world. So our motivation was that we wanted to find fact-checked information from China and Korea, the countries that suffered from COVID-19 much earlier than others, and send out the fact-checked information in many different languages to the countries where these COVID-19 are about to start. So this campaign started sometime in early April. It was, um, it was discussed in the end of March and it was launched in early April and it went on for two months. 
I'm going to show a short video describing the campaign. So this campaign um, was launched through social media. It was launched through survey platforms, and we have we have gotten so many feedback. Um, we got feedback from some teachers in China and Kazakhstan, and telling telling us that you know they could use it in their their online class to to talk about the misinformation and fact checks. So you could come to our webpage. Um, that's going to be shown one more time in this slide, and then you could see some of the testimonials and the feedbacks. And you could also see the, the infographics of the messages. So what did we find from this campaign? The goal of this campaign was to disseminate the fact checks during early phase of the virus so that we wanted to send out fact checked information before even rumors starts to propagate in, in some of the countries. And we met 50 wonderful volunteers around the world who translated the infographics for free in 20 different languages. And these infographics reached 151 countries, reaching more than 50,000 people. So I'm going to be showing a couple of findings based on the data set. And if anyone is really interested in looking into the data set, um, please um, contact me. So finding number one, we had 151 countries, but we wanted to focus on a subset of the countries where we have at least 50 participants. And for each participant, as we spread these fact checks, we also asked their age, gender, also their, also their um, financial status, and how they perceive COVID-19, whether they think COVID-19 is a real threat or a fake threat. And we also asked them, have you seen this rumor? Have you also seen fact checks to this rumor? Do you actually believe the rumor? And if the vaccine would be available now, would you take it? So here are some of the findings based on the questions that we got. So the number one finding is that developing countries, countries with less infrastructure, were at a larger risk of exposure to the infodemic. So the countries on the x-axis are sorted by their GDP per capita, and the y-axis is showing the claims the percentage of participants who say they have seen the claim. The poorer countries have larger rates of exposure. And this is pretty alarming because um, there are a lot of things that the poorer countries go through. I mean, the whole world is going through a lot of things and they're even exposed to much more level, higher level of infodemic. Our finding number two is there were cultural differences in the kinds of the claims that reached different regions of the world. So we have grouped the observations at the continent level in, the, in these spider charts, and we are showing at each continent what is the level of exposure to particular claims and what is the level of the exposure to the fact checks of the same claim. And, 
And we could also group the claims. We had about 30 different claims and we could group them into different categories. For example, some claims have to do with the 5G conspiracy. Some claims have to do with the weather. Um, whether claims are hot in the hot weather or in rainy weather, the coronavirus will not survive. Some claims have to do with gargling, you know, gar gargling with either salt water or other things. Some claims have to do with vinegar, apple cider vinegar, different kinds of vinegar, you know. So, and the drugs claims mean existing drugs can be used to cure coronavirus. So the spider chart shows if the chart has a larger area covering, that means that particular claim has been seen much more in that continent. And the scales are from zero to 100%. So I'm gonna break down these thin graphs into a couple of observations. First one is that for every single continent, claims about weather and drugs are the most popular. So these rumors reach the largest population. And luckily, their fact checks also are the highest as well. Certain claims are like gargling can cure the virus in the neck or sunbathing, you know, standing in the sun for a couple of minutes or tens of minutes every day can cure the virus. So these rumors were most popular in Asia, but not so much in Europe or other countries. And vaccine conspiracies and 5G claims were seen in Africa Europe and North America, but they were not as seen that much in Asia. For example, um, vaccine conspiracy, like there, the vaccine has popu population control conspiracy so that taking the vaccine, you won't be able to have babies. Or there's a tracking device implemented in the vaccines. These rumors were seen less than 25% in the Asia region. But these rumors reached above 50% in other continents. Our finding number three is that the fact checks are, if, are effective to certain populations, but not equally to all of the populations. So we have built a regression model it, where the dependent variable is what is the chance of somebody taking the vaccine? So are you willing to take a vaccine if the vaccine would have been made available now? And on the, the independent variables are all the other features that we asked. So, I, so this graph, this chart is showing the marginal effects of each of the factors and whatever appears on the right-hand side means those factors contributed positively to the vaccine acceptance. Whatever appears on the left-hand side means those factors contributed negatively to the vaccine acceptance. Let's first look at the top right. This is about vaccine non-required means that if somebody had been has taken non-required vaccines in the past, the person is really highly likely to take the vaccine for COVID-19. And now focus on these yellow circles. So this is looking at two different effects. One is the effect of exposure to a vaccine rumor. Another circle at the bottom is looking at the effect of exposure to the fact check of the vaccine rumor. And they are equally apart from the zero line, meaning that exposure to a vaccine rumor will negatively impact the vaccine acceptance. But seeing the fact check can discount that. So fact check had been really effective in, in discounting the negative effect of a exposure of a rumor. One observation that we make related to the it, um, very positive reaction that we see is perception of threat. Some people who 
really think that COVID-19 is a serious threat to themselves or to their community, to their family, that they will they are going to take the COVID-19 vaccine. But if people were not were thinking there, they think COVID-19 is not a real threat, the chance of taking the vaccine went down. Now going to the alarming part is believability. So even though fact checks are really effective in discounting the exposure of a rumor, when people already start to believe in these false claims, their chance of taking the vaccine went down very to a very large degree. So this means that fact checks are Im important and they can discount the exposure, but this will not happen to individuals who already start to believe in the claims. And this could also mean that we have to be really preemptive and make sure that rumors don't even reach the population. I'm gonna shift the gear A and talk a little bit about what are the emotions that are associated with rumor propagation? We were, um, we were interested in the emotion because we saw these news that violence increases during the pandemic. And for cities that went through the lockdown, there had been more riots and domestic violence. And we also saw lots of racist comments during the pandemic. So there's some degree of anger related to pandemic and how does this affect the rumor misinformation propagation? So we focus on the, the anger emotion and try to see whether anger emotion actually contributes to the misinformation spreading. Our work was published in HKS Misinformation Review, and I think the audience in this conference will find this venue particularly interesting. We have, there are tons of interesting research published in this venue. So here's the background. Two of the predominant emotion that we see related to COVID-19 is anxiety and anger. Anxiety means that people are feeling helpless. They feel they don't have the control over the situation. So it's lots of uncertainty, overestimating risk. And the literature puts it that anxiety will lead to behavior reconsideration. And in terms of online behaviors, this will link to information seeking behavior, like searching about COVID-19. On the contrary, the literature puts that anger emotion will lead to more strong action tendencies. And this is because angry people be in the back of their mind thinking, think that something could be done, but it's not being done. So they find injustice and this would lead to really strong actions. In terms of online, this would lead to more of information sharing than seeking. So this, there have been wonderful literature like this and combining this and putting this together to COVID-19, we wanted to understand whether angry individuals versus anxious individuals, which type of emotion are more likely to be associated with misinformation. Our study was conducted to a large population of Korean adults. And we also looked at the impact of political leaning of individuals together with these two different emotions. And this is our finding. We do find an indirect effect of anger and anxiety moderated by the political leaning on misinformation. The solid line means the p-values are less than 0 0.05, and the dotted or the dashed line means the effects was not as um, not significant. So what this figure shows is anger emotion, anger times political leaning, it's an interaction term, has strong tendency towards believing in false claims 
And once people believe in false claims and when, when they have the angry emotion, they're more likely to share information. But anxiety did not lead to such same effect. And to understand this interaction effect between the anger emotion and pol political leaning, we break down the, the groups of people into their anger level and political leaning. So the two bars on the right show people who express they are not as angry about the situation. For both conservatives and liberals, there's not much difference in the belief in false information related to COVID-19. But when there were ang for angry individuals and anger was measured as a survey question, we were asking a couple of questions related to the anger emotions. Are you angry about COVID-19, about the situation, about certain other things? And we do see significant difference in the scale of the beliefs for the false information. And the belief in the false information then has strong effect to the sharing of that information. So together, we could see that angry people, angry individuals were more likely to share misinformation. And that tendency was a little more evident among conservatives than liberals. But that doesn't mean that liberals are not sharing misinformation. The tendency was just both are sharing as when they're angry, but conservatives, we could find a little more if stronger. If In the paper, we also discuss how the South Korean strategy, the government strategy could have helped anger management and misinformation sharing. So the Korean government had been really consistent and clear in terms of giving guidelines about COVID-19 from the start. So from the very beginning, the government had asked people to do social distancing, also, you know, staying home on the weekends. We get messages every every week, every, you know, asking people to stay home, um, don't go to public places and wear masks all the time. And whenever you're coughing, do the elbow, elbow coughing because um, elbow coughing was not as widely, you know, practiced in Korea before, but now everyone does that. And the government had really consistent voice and whichever media platform you go, you could always find the same guidelines, the portals, on the, on the top of the every search portal, you could see the link, you could see the infographic. So it was really consistent. And we also had the largest election, one of the largest election during the peak of the COVID-19 in South Korea. And there, um, there are some discussions that say, because we went through the election during the, the pandemic, and there were clear guidelines, even during the election, we had to stay like a meter apart and wear gloves for voting and masks. So there were lots of actions that were guided and done, and that could manage the action tendencies of angry individuals. So here are some takeaways. So, we find that from our facts before rumors campaign, we find that detection algorithms are not enough to fight against misinformation during the pandemic. Because once rumors spread, and once some people start to believe, it's really hard to fix. It's hard, really hard to even contain that rumor, even after fact checks are made available, because most pe many people do not are not aware of the fact checks. So preemptive measures might be more cost, cost effective so that preemptive measures of sending out the facts much earlier on rather than being reactive about the fact checks, that could be really critical. Our second observation is the spread of false information was largely determined by culture. We could see certain claims were more popular in certain regions of the world than the others. And it would be interesting um, if future studies can look into 
why how cert, why certain claims are really you know well versed in certain regions than the others and what happens to people's um, information the process of perceiving information how do how do people get to believe in certain misinformation and finally, certain emotions like anger, we find anger to have stronger tendency, stronger association with misinformation sharing. So a good strategy might be to do some anger management at the public level. So anger is action tendencies. So rather than giving information, which might be useful for people who are feeling anxious and fearful, anger management could could really tackle that action tendency. So give them straightforward guidelines. And if guidelines keep changing or if different media platforms are talking about different set of rules and it might make people more angry. So I think we, we, we do believe that um, there could be some good strategies to help people calm down their anger and anxiety at the same time. So this wraps up my talk, and I really look forward to the questions at the live session. And this is a picture of the institute that I work. And if you are working on the field of you know misinformation, um, data driven, social computational social science, if you come to Korea or Asia region, please drop me an email. I'd be happy to host your talk and so on. Okay, thank you.